Chapter 13, Witnesses. It was dark in the walled city that night. Only the lights of our little room blazed out bravely in the sultry gloom. Four or five boys lounged around watching a table tennis game. Into the light slipped a pathetic figure, very young and very thin, and very ad clearly addicted to heroin. I recognized B.B., Winston's youngest brother, who was called B.B. because he was the baby of the family. He was on the run from the police. They had let him out for one day's holiday from prison, and he had not gone back. I called him, sat him on a wooden bench away from the tennis table, and told him about Jesus. He be seemed to begin to understand, but he did not say more, stay more than half an hour. Boys on the run can never stay long in a, any place. He promised me to come back again, and some days later, or it may have been weeks, he did come back. I told him more so that he would know enough to make the decision to follow Jesus if he so chose. I warned him that he, had, that he now had to make up his mind for himself. I can't go on seeing you because I'll be breaking the law if I encourage you to visit me here, I said. If I do not know where you live, that's one thing. But if I'm regularly seeing you here, I will be obliged to turn you in. I will pray for you, and as soon as you're ready to follow Jesus, tell me and I will go with you to the police station and help you give yourself up. I will go through the whole thing with you, because if you really start to pray, I know you can be helped. Bibi did not turn himself in. Later he was arrested and sent back to prison. I went to see him, and there we talked. And on his release he went back to drugs. For the next few months he dropped into the youth club occasionally, and then I heard he had been arrested for two very serious crimes. One charge was for wounding a newspaper seller and stealing his watch. The second charge was for robbery with assault. The police claimed that they had found identity cards and property from the victims on Bibi when they arrested him. As soon as I heard the details, I knew that Bibi could not be guilty of at least one of these charges. He was in the youth club talking to me at the time that he was supposed to have been robbing the newspaper seller. I hurried to see him in prison and discovered to my horror that he wanted to plead guilty because, although he was innocent of these particular charges, he had done about 20 other robberies in a completely different area of Kowloon. He said in a resigned tone, Let's just get it over with and plead guilty. You can't, I insisted. You really can't. It isn't the truth. Tell the judge you have done the other things, but tell the truth. When the case came up, B.B. pleaded innocent, but was found guilty in spite of my evidence, which was the only time that he believed. I had spoken the truth, but he had thought another witness was confused about the time of the incident and the case was closed. I had spent days in court praying through the proceedings, so inevitably the policemen and the prison officers got to know me. At the end of the trial, I was walking out of the courtroom when the police inspector stopped me. How come you are involved in all this, he asked. Well, I'm a Christian. Why are you giving evidence for the criminal then? Pressed the officer. I know he's a criminal. I know he's a drug addict. I know he has done many, many robberies, but he did not do this one. I know because I am his alibi. Oh, said the policeman. Well, I'm a Christian too. Look at it my way. When these people commit crimes, we know who did it, but we can't always get them for it. So we charge them with what we can make it, what we can make stick. It's rough but fair, and society benefits. You may think it's fair enough to arrest somebody on a wrong charge, and he may even think it's fair because of what he has got away with. But in the long term, the effect on society is bad. There is no respect for the law, or the police, or the truth. The criminal learns to think the way all criminals think, that getting caught is not connected with guilt or innocence. It is merely bad luck. They certainly never t learn to tell the difference between right and wrong. I felt very strongly about this, and I launched into the attack. Well, at least they receive some kind of punishment for their crimes, reasoned the inspector. But they don't feel they are paying for the wrong that they have done, I encountered. I know men in prison for crimes they claim they have not committed. They are viciously bitter about being locked up on false charges. The first thing they want to do when they get out is do the crime to fit the punishment. Never mind that the ones... Never mind the ones they did before. They feel they have already served time and they are owed the crime. Surprised at my tirade, the officer ended the conversation lamely. I've never thought of it like that, and hurried away. I met Bibi when he came out of prison again. He looked like a rat that had never seen the sunlight. 
His face was a mauve gray, and he had dark shadows under his eyes. He went straight back to his drug. He had promised to change, but like most addicts, he was powerless. He had a celebration meal of heroin on the day of his release. Although he did not plan it that way, addicts have a favorite saying that describes their feelings on arriving in the drug den. My heart had not decided where to go, but my feet walked themselves. To pay for his habit, Bibi found a job as a refu refuse collector in the walled city. He had to drag large rattan baskets slopping excrement through the alleys. It was the lowest form of work, but it gave him a little money to begin buying his heroin. To supplement his earnings, he went back to robbing people as well. Whenever he saw me, he would run away. But I kept in touch by getting things on the grapevine and walking around the streets, and I usually knew where he was living. When a te television film unit came to make a film of our work, we contacted Bibi and filmed him at home. The drug had eaten into his flesh and sharp etched his bones. He shivered continuously. His family turned into a soap opera. His mother sobbed. Make my son good, Poon Siu Jay. Make him good. Take him into your house and make him good. His eldest brother whined in chorus. Make him good, Miss Poon. Make him good. It could not work like that, of course. Bibi knew the truth, that he alone had to make the decision to change and that no one else could make it for him. I learned that there is a time for meeting and a time and talking, and then ultimately a time for not meeting anymore. For Bibi, that time had come, <clears throat> so I told him that we had reached the end. This is the last time I am coming to see you. From now on, I am not going to visit you anymore because you know the way to Jesus. It is up to you now. You can choose if you want to follow him or not. You know about him, and, I know, and you know I care about you. It is because I care about you that I don't want to see you again. I don't want to see you in this state anymore. When you are ready for change, the time this time you must look for me. A week later, Bibi came. I'm ready now, he said. I've had enough. There's no way I can get off drugs myself. My family despises me. I can't stay at home because I've got to sell drugs to buy my own. I have I also have to be involved in the gambling dens because I need the money. Please, please help me. We prayed together for a long time. Bibi was filled with the Spirit and began to speak in a new language. Then he looked at me and stated, Now you've got to take me back into your house. He meant that he wanted to be admitted into third house. I took a deep breath and said, I'm very sorry, but there's no room. Bibi was frantic and very angry. For him, the chance to get into one of the houses of Stephen was his only escape left. He shouted, But you have to let me in. You have to let me go there. Now I'm going to follow Jesus and you can't expect me to live on the streets. I'll go on taking heroin there and you can't be a Christian and go on taking heroin. He was right, of course. So I pleaded for him with the Willenses and the workers of the third house, but they turned me down. We can't take him into the house because the house is not in good order, said Sarah. You just have to, I argued. That's the whole reason why we have houses. They are there so that we can take care of the new boys who come to Christ so that they can grow up into a new life. Now you won't let me bring in boys because you want a nice, tidy house? Sarah replied firmly, It's not helpful to anyone at all to bring a boy into a house if, like this if the relationships are not solid enough to support him. We must wait until the boys we already have settle down. The houses are like a family. It's important to have the relationships right inside before we take in more people. She was right, too. While I was desperate to bring people into the houses as soon as they became Christians, her duty was to protect the family members. If I rec recklessly poured people in, the whole situation would become as chaotic as if it had been before we had the houses of Stephen. When they refused to take Bibi, I had to go back and tell him that there was no room. We met at Ah Wong's noodle stall in the Lung Kong Road. You could get a marvelous little wonton dumpling and noodles there. Bibi raged at me in desperation when he heard the news, that I, and I had an, an, to answer, Just for a moment, Bibi, take your eyes off of yourself. Forget that our house is going to save you. Look up at the sky. It's not, very, it's not a very beautiful sky down in Kowloon City, but just look up and imagine the one who made all that sky, the heavens and the earth and the sea and the birds. He's the one who makes even the things like drops in buckets, and he stretches out the heavens like a tent and makes the mountains and the animals and the flowers. The one actually chooses 
that his spirit should live in us. He chooses that his spirit should live in us, rotten as we are. Why? Because Jesus left all that glory and walked through the miserable walled city and got beaten up and killed and died and then rose again so that we could have his spirit. Isn't it amazing that the spirit of God who created the whole world should actually come to live in us? Just take your eyes off our house, saving you. Instead, imagine the wonder of our God. I left Bibi there at the noodle stall, praying, so that I could talk with another addict who was pressuring me to be admitted. Half an hour later, when I came back to Bibi, I found him, eyes shut with a soft smile on his face. I called to him, but he did not reply. I called more loudly, but still there was no answer. At my third shout, Bibi very reluctantly opened his eyes. What do you see? I asked him. He told me that he had seen Jesus, at least he thought it was Jesus, wearing a long white robe. He had been on a mountain and Jesus had come toward him with his hand held out. He said to Bibi, Bibi, will you follow me? Bibi replied, well, yes, Lord, who else? Jesus had taken him by the hand and led him along the most beautiful path. I can hardly describe it, Bibi searched for the words in his meager experience. It was so beautiful, there were lovely flowers and birds and it was very sweet-smelling. It was the most lovely place. We walked along this path, and I heard you calling, but I didn't want to come back. I heard you calling again, and I still didn't want to come back. From that time onward, instead of believing that our house was going to save him now that he was a Christian, he looked again at his Creator to do so. His peaked face was illuminated like by a glow. There was room for him in our third house just one day later, and he stayed for two years. He became one of the best boys we had, never guilt difficult, even when he was coming off drugs, which he did without so much as a headache. He simply got up and lived normally all through the withdrawal process. Bibi's family called Jean and Rick to say that Bibi's father was about to die, so Bibi went to see him in the hospital. When he arrived, his father, who had come off opium himself and had become a believer, said simply, Now that Jesus had made my sons good, I am ready to go to heaven. He kissed both his sons a tender farewell, but instead of dying, he was healed as his sons prayed for him, and a week later he was discharged. Now that I was free of the need to be a homemaker because there were several of us working together at Stephen, I could go back to the streets. So many of the addicts passed on the word that people came from all areas all over the colony asking for help. A converted policeman gave me a two-way radio so that I could be reached any time of day or at any place. And I found myself more and more involved in the courts and prisons where so many of the boys were shocking, shocked into facing their problems. One day I attended a trial in Causeway Bay. As I was walking out of, after the case, I heard a cry behind me, Poon Siu Jay, I've been framed, help me, help me. I looked around to see the next defendant being led into the, led into the dock. He was a stranger to me. I could see the desperation of his dirt-streaked face. It was a very cool air-conditioned courtroom. He was standing in the cotton shorts and singlet in which he had been arrested. The boy was still gesticulating wildly as the magistrate came into the courtroom to start the case. I had no means of knowing whether or not he spoke the truth and no right to speak in court even, after, even if I had known. However, this unimpressive boy was about to go into battle alone, and as there was no legal aid to offer the magistrate's court at that time, I stood up with an inspiration. Your Honor, I said, I am not familiar with the defendant, but I think it's possible that he has not had reasonable access to legal representation. Could you remand this case so that the inquiries could be made on his behalf? The magistrate raised his eyebrows. This was an unusual request coming from a layperson. He turned to the defendant, shivering in the dock. Do you wish to be represented? He asked him. Yes, said the boy. But I have not been allowed to make a telephone call since my arrest, and, since, and so none of my family knows that I am here. The magistrate remanded the case for one day, and I went down to the police cells below the court to talk to the boy. In two minutes allowed me, I learned that his nickname was Sor Chuen, or Crazy Boy Chuen, and that he knew of me through his Chaiwan brothers. He was shaking violently, and his stale sweat was sour. His eyes were red and running, and he sniffed constantly. I had one minute left. 
Listen to me, I said. I have no time to tell you about Jesus, but if you call on his name, he will hear you and save you. He is God. Under the astonished gaze of the prison guard, his withdrawal symptoms immediately vanished and his face relaxed. When I saw him the next day, he was still dressed in the dirty shorts and singlet, but his face was clear and happy. I really did call upon Jesus, and now I feel quite different, he said. Sor Chuen was found guilty of the charges laid against him and went to prison briefly. Shortly after coming out, he was arrested again, but this time he telephoned me from the police station. I went down to see him with an excellent young solicitor who sometimes helped us. Sor Chuen had been arrested on a charge of attempting to break into several cars in the Shaokiwan district. According to him, the story was quite untrue. He claimed that he had actually been watching a pornographic film called Legends of Lust several miles away in the Wan Chai. After the movie finished, he had boarded a 14-man bus for Chai Wan, but was stopped on the way by two detectives who asked him to alight from the van and, quote, talk. They asked him to help find another triad nicknamed Mor Kwai, or Devil, and drove him in a private car to a cinema looking for the triad. Sor Chuen saw a friend there, but Devil could not be located. He was taken to the police station and booked on an attempted robbery charge after signing some kind of incriminating statement in the policeman's notebook. Nearly every time that Sor Chuen was arrested, he yelled, Frame! He, like so many other boys, claimed to have been beaten up to make a confession. I discovered that a good number of them were not beaten, but they were so sure of the inevitability of a beating that they convinced themselves that it was as good as having taken place and signed statements incriminating themselves. A high proportion of defended cases contained a voir dire, a trial within a trial, to determine whether a confession was admissible as evidence. Many a defendant was convicted solely on the strength of his confession in a police notebook without witnesses, exhibits, or corroborative evidence. David, the solicitor, and I decided to do some investigate, investigative work. David was willing to defend Sor Chuen without fee, provided he was convinced of his innocence. So he wrote to the police for the registration numbers of the cars that Sor Chuen allegedly tried to enter. I went looking for Devil, but found that he had been arrested too. However, I found the friend in Chai Wan, who had been outside the cinema when Sor Chuen arrived with the detectives looking for Devil. He remembered the date and the time, and it was three hours before the official time when Sor Chuen was arrested in Shai Shao Kai Wan. While I made these inquiries, Sor Chuen was still in prison on remand and had no opportunity to contact his friend. I was convinced that he was telling the truth, as their testimonies were identical. When we got to the registra- when we got the registration vehicle numbers, we took a taxi to Sheko, where the boy there lived a boy who owned one of the cars involved in the alleged crime. He worked in a button factory in Wan Chai. So we chased back, located the buttonholer, and asked him where he usually parked his car. Usually in the Shaikuan, Shaokiwan parking lot, he said. But on the date of the crime, it had not been there. Now we had a case. Now we had witnesses. All this fuss over such a minor case was unusual, and the Attorney General's department was alerted. They sent counsel to conduct the prosecution, usually in magistrate's courts. A police inspector fulfilled this function. During a break in the case, the prosecuting counsel asked to speak to me. I had noticed him becoming more and more touchy as the morning proceedings crawled along. He was extremely annoyed at the detailed cross-examination by the defense and kept looking at his watch. Why are you two going to, to so much trouble for such a minor case, he asked. We should have disposed of it by now. As it is, we have to continue into the afternoon. It is such a small matter anyway. I knew that I should not discuss this case, and I said, shouldn't one present the best case possible in the interests of the defendant? Yes, but why waste time on such a case at all, he objected, very upset at spending his valuable time on this trivial trivial affair. Because I believe the defendant is innocent, I said. He looked at me astounded. That man has a record of a dozen or so convictions, didn't you know? Yes, I know. But we are talking about today's charges. I am sure he did not commit that crime. Well, my dear, said the barrister, patronizing me. I have been in Hong Kong for six months now. This was one of the few cases I was involved in which the defendant was found not guilty. 
but as a writer, the magistrate also handed a bouquet to the police, saying that we, they had done an excellent job, and that the fact, the, and that the fact that the accused had been acquitted, reflected in no way adversely on their testimony. So I was landed with Sorchuan, praying in the cells after our first meeting had taught him that Jesus was alive, but he had yet to learn that the way to be his disciple was not going to see legends of lust. One sec, I'm going to glance at something real fast. Following this case, David helped with several more and helped to pull off a legal first in Hong Kong. It was on the occasion when two Chai Wan boys, along with some of the others, were arrested for claiming to be members of a triad society. The legal point was interesting. While you cannot be arrested for being a silent triad member, you can be arrested for claiming to be one. For this reason, the police needed signed confessions for the charges to hold up. The boys had signed alleged confessions in the police station, but later said that they didn't did so under duress and that they were taught what to write. The others pleaded guilty. MOTS, the members of triad society cases as they were known, were usually rapidly dealt with, but this one became extremely complicated. Both the boys charged had become Christians a year previously. A number of us were praying that this trial would somehow glorify God. One of the issues in the case was indeed a spiritual one. To join and remain an active member of a triad society was a self-commitment that could not be consistent with Christianity. To take part in a triad initiation ceremony, there was bloodletting and an invoking of spirits, which the law recognized as evil by defining it as an indictable offense. The police produced their expert witness, a 426 Red Pole fighter. He got up in court and gave his evidence. I am a 14K office bearer. I say that according to triad rules, you are always a triad member forever. You cannot leave the triads. Even though I now spend my life giving evidence at police trials, I still remain an office bearer in the 14K. The case for the defense rested on exactly opposite assumptions. We claim that our boys were no longer triad members because they had renounced their triad membership by being baptized as Christians. The boys stated in court, Yes, we were triad members, but we are no longer. Our solicitor produced another expert witness, a Chinese language scholar, who pointed out that the boys' confessions had been translated as saying, I am a triad member. The translation was open to question because there is no present or past tense in Chinese. We contended that what their statement meant was, Yes, I was a triad member. Yes, I did join a triad society but now I'm not actively involved. Then we produced yet another expert witness, A.K., who held the same rank as the police witness in the 14K Triad Society. He rose to his feet in court and said, I too am a 426 Red Pole of the 14K, but I've become a Christian. I have renounced my entire gang. These two boys here on trial were my younger brothers. Since I have given up the gang, I have told the members that I no longer hold responsibility for them. If they want to follow Christ, they can, or they, else they can go their own way. This clinched matters, matters for the judge. He had been forced to spend hour after hour listening to talk of baptisms and conversions, whereas usually in triad cases, the accused were speedily found guilty or not guilty. He announced to the court, I see no reason why a man should be branded for life. If he wants to change and become a Christian, then good. Then the judge turned and said, And now, Miss Pullinger, it is your responsibility to see that they continue to follow what they are supposed to have confessed. Case dismissed. One of the reasons why there were no, not more acquittals was that people in Hong Kong were very unwilling to give evidence in court. There was a deep distrust of legal proceedings and a feeling that every case was rigged. Being a fervent believer in the fairness of the British judicial system, I tried to persuade them that if only they spoke for themselves or their friends with complete honesty, they were bound to be justified. The fact that so many cases went against them was largely due to their own apathy. 
they contributed to the inequities of the system they so berated. Through attending so many court sessions, I began to notice some characters who seemed up to appear with remarkable regularity. There was a little granny with a long plate down her back and a total of two teeth and a beautifully deep-lined and weathered face. She held what appeared to be a shopping list and sat in court each morning, pleading guilty to at least 20 different hawking offenses under all different names. As each one was called out, she would raise her hand and squeak, You are, meaning, I'm here, and then mark off on her little sheet of paper the amount to be paid. I discovered that this was her career. She no longer stood laboriously in the streets hawking her goods. Instead, for a small fee, she stood in all, for all her market friends at court so that they could continue their little businesses. She had a male counterpart, a delightful 70-year-old man who squatted outside the courtroom playing cards with his mates. He knew exactly where to go in for his hearing, and every week he was there. The charges were read off, out, smoking opium and being in possession of instruments for doing so. He nodded happily. Fifty-eight previous convictions for similar offenses. He went on nodding and beaming. One hundred dollars or fifty dollars or one day in prison. He looked as if he would explode with joy and walked out beaming broadly. I mentioned to Akiung, who was sitting with me, what bad luck it was that he always got caught. Oh no, it was not an accident, laughed Akiung. He is an actor. He is paid to be arrested by the drug den owners. I learned that when the den operators were informed of a police raid, raid, they closed the premises and left behind one old addict who was then arrested and charged. Because of his old age and the number of convictions, he would give a minimum sentence. The den paid him $150 for this and provided free opium so that he was able to indulge his habit and after paying his fine, still make a small profit. The police were pleased. The operators were pleased. The actor was delighted, and Hong Kong's arrest tally was impressive. Ah Keung's father was one of those who would have nothing to do with the courts. He asked me on one occasion to help his fifth son, Ah Pui, who had been arrested for stealing a radio from an elderly man outside the walled city. At the exact time, Ah Pui had been actually inside the walled city, talking to an old woman. The woman refused to be a witness, as her job was to sweep a gambling den. His father also saw two detectives take him away from there, but he refused to give a testimony on behalf of his own son. Pa Ma Fan, he did not want to get involved. Don't want to get involved, too much trouble. Because he was involved in illegal gambling himself, and because the den had some arrangements with some policemen, he felt that keeping good relationships was important than vindicting Apui. Nevertheless, he hoped that I would help his innocent son. I explained that because he was withholding the vital evidence, there was nothing I could do. He, however, had an unshakable conviction that I knew the judge and merely had to wink at him in court to free the boy. Had he known the judge, he would have winked. It was a hard line to take. I had to be extra careful not to be eaten up with anger over the injustice when truth was rejected. I also had to avoid being used as a source of free legal aid by rascals who had no desire to change. In one case, a young man returned from seeing a solicitor I had recommended, complaining, he's no good, he did not even teach me a story to tell in court, what a waste of money. Yet it was not a waste of time. Many people's lives were touched through the legal cases, and if there seemed to be a lack of justification in earthly courts, there was a growing number of people who understood being justified in heavenly ones. A reformed criminal named Suen Jai was a glowing example of this. He had led a straight life for ten years, working very hard to support his wife and four young children. When he was arrested and convicted for pickpocketing charge, I was certain he could not have committed it. It was a particularly cruel blow for him to be imprisoned for a crime he had not done. Suen Jai's wife contacted me and I visited him in remand prison. He was an angry and bitter man. He wanted to talk about his retrial. I wanted to talk about Jesus. He did not want to be preached at, at and was still abrasive, so I prayed. Then he stopped raging and became calm. I had no Bibles with me, only a little booklet containing extracts from the Sermon on the Mount. I did not feel this was very suitable, as it did not contain much about God's love and forgiveness, or the means of salvation. 
It was mainly good work teaching. However, I had nothing else, so I left it for him to read. When I went to visit him next in a small when I went to visit a small group in the remand center, Su Enjai was sitting there among them. I asked them, why did Jesus have to die? Su Enjai answered straight off with the most ad- academic reply, because it says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the last least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Su Enjai had never been to a Christian meeting in his life and had only studied four years in primary school, but he had an amazing understand of script, understanding of Scripture. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount led him to belief. He asked Jesus into his life and received the Holy Spirit. Shortly before his retrial, I asked Su Enjai how he would present his defense. He said that previously he had been very angry and had lots of abusive things to say. Now, he now decided not to present a defense apart from saying, not guilty. I began to advise him differently, but he stopped me short. It says in the Bible, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I said no more. Su and Jai was found guilty. Although I was convinced he had been framed and was serving 15 months for a crime he had not done, I remain, he remained cheerful and never stopped praising God. In fact, his neighbors who heard about his demeanor at the trial were so impressed that they organized a meeting in a resettlement block and asked me and some of the boys to go and tell them about Jesus, who could change a hard man's heart. One day, Su Enjai told me that he had led 12 prisoners to Christ. I was a bit doubtful as I knew that his theology was only based on three chapters of Matthew, a few visits from me and his own experience. He had never read personal evangelism, four steps into Christ, or undergone a counseling course, so I questioned him about the circumstances. Well, he said, one night one of my cellmates woke up screaming. It was as if he had been grabbed by the neck and he began to writhe on his bunk and suffocate. I could see that he was in the grip of a spirit and couldn't breathe. So I got up and said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, get out. Nothing happened. So I said, get out, I tell you. I made as if to kick the spirit, and it left him. So he lay quite relaxed and peaceful. At that, the eleven other cellmates got up and asked me, what was that? How did you do that? That was Jesus, I replied. And they said they wanted to believe too, so I told them how. Three days after his relief, Su Enjai's wife ran away with another man and prostituted herself. Su Enjai was then supporting and looking after eight children, as his widower brother was a drug addict with four of his own. He remained faithful in prayer, and in future meetings with his wife so impressed her with his compassion and forgiveness that she eventually came back to him. His family and friends despised him for the weakness of his approach to her. His behavior was particularly remarkable in view of the Chinese culture that demanded divorce or a savage beating for errant wives. For some time, he continued the prayer meetings on his 10 by 12 foot resettlement room, inviting all the neighbors. One ex-prisoner who attended explained, I received Christ because I saw what had happened to my friend after he believed in Jesus, and I couldn't not believe. Not only did God work miracles in the hearts of criminals, but also on several occasions he deeply affected others involved in the trial. When Akit's case had come up in court, Jean, myself, and several members of our group went to listen. We prayed for a long time in the spirit before arriving and also silently in the courtroom. After the verdict releasing him into our care was announced, the arresting police inspector came to chat with us and was extremely friendly and interested in our work. He suggested that we lunch together so that we could continue the talk. He liked talking and it was several hours later that he managed to say what was important to him. You know, I feel terribly embarrassed saying this, he confessed in his charming Scots brogue. When you came in into the court this morning, I looked at you and said, well, it was like those Christmas cards. I know you'll laugh, and I feel awfully silly saying this, but well, there was just a halo over your head. Ted was a big man, a Hong Kong judo champion, second row forward in the police rugby team, and obviously serious. I did not feel a bit like laughing, but I swallowed several times. We invited Ted to our usual Saturday evening prayer meetings, and he came gladly. 
I don't think I have ever seen one, anyone's more knocked sideways by a prayer meeting. At the end of the meeting, he was sitting there and gasping. Jean chatted to him and gave him a drink and some canaps. He continued sitting there in silence for a while, and then he said, You'll never believe me, but this is the strangest Saturday I've ever spent in my life. Normally I'm out with the boys every Saturday night drinking. Tonight I have watched you people really inspired by something I don't quite understand. I was relieved to hear him so positive, because during the meeting a girl had come up to him and bluntly asked him bluntly whether he was saved. I was worried lest he had been put off by such a direct approach. Clearly he had not been, so he sent him home with a copy of Jean's book. All Sunday, Ted read the book. He was most upset because he could not dismiss the evidence in it. Finally, he got down on his knees and prayed. Then he rang up, rang us up and asked if he could come around, because he wanted to receive the baptism of the Spirit for himself. He said, I just couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about last night. I came to the conclusion that either you are all completely crazy or what you said is true. I've heard for myself people speaking in tongues. I've seen it for myself the way the bo- these boys' lives have changed. So I came to the conclusion that Jesus has to be true. If, and if he was true, that affected me. And I asked him to come into my life this morning. The following Sunday, Ted was baptized in the sea together with a former gang member and his wife. The officer's conversion had become widely known. His friends could see that his life was completely changed in big ways. Like his general attitude to work and in small ways, like no longer swearing at the rubby scrum. One of his superintendents joked with him at the match. No praying in tongues in the scrum, Ted. It gives you an unfair advantage. Though the superintendent was joking, there was no doubt that Ted's conversion made a big impact on the Hong Kong police. Not long afterward, one of Ted's colleagues who was opposed to his conversion said, At least I hope you are not trying to change me. No, replied Ted. I'm not trying to change you. I know you'll be all right when you repent, so there's plenty of time. But what if I snuff it first, said the scoffer. Well, yes, there's that, said Ted.